guys, let's go into getting a huge chest, right? So, um, basically, when we talk about the chest overall, um, we covered four different topics, right? We covered the um, muscle fiber makeup of the chest, and that was the first thing we talked about. And we talked about it being um, primarily fast twitch. So the um, so basically we're talking about 60% fast twitch and 40% slow twitch. So when you think about muscle fiber types, you know what do fast twitch muscle fibers do? Or type two fibers? What do they do? We think about them more as more like the heavier loading, the um, more the explosive type of movements. That's the general way we think about like fast switch muscle fibers and what they do. So you're talking about like, um, you know, lifting at least within, uh, um, you know, probably within a 12 repetition range, anywhere from one to 12 reps. Now, don't get me wrong. You can recruit fast switch fibers with 12 to 15, so long as you're going to fatigue. But again, in general, we're talking about within one to 12 reps, um, heavier loads, probably longer rest periods are gonna hit those fast switch muscle fibers. Um, the slower twist muscle fibers are going to be more like past 12 repetitions. Um, and so that's kind of important to realize. And it can even be like large sets, like something like um, super sets, giant sets, you know, where I'm doing like a bench press. And then I'm doing super setting that with, um, you know, possibly dumbbell bench and then flies, you know, uh, and then ca you know, cable flies. Those are such high repetitions that you're gonna end up having to um, really tap in and hypertrophy a lot of the slow twitch muscle fibers. So, you know, uh, you're gonna wanna have a you know, wide variety of repetitions to kind of maximize that. Again, probably wanna spend maybe like 60% of your time in a 12, one to 12 repetition range. If you're bodybuilding, more like six to 12 repetition range. And then um, the rest of the other 40% of the time, probably greater than 12 reps, you know, 12 to 15 reps, maybe some burnouts with 20 reps, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> the next thing we talked about was the angle of um, bench press. And basically we talked about, particularly when we talked about like the lower chest and the upper chest. So, um, and when we talk about optimizing angle, Will, what's the optimal angle you would say for optimizing like a, um, say the upper chest overall? We're looking at about a 40 degree angle. About 40 degree angle um, is gonna be probably optimal for the upper chest, right? Um, when you start going especially like past 50 degrees, you know, you're gonna have less activation in, in the upper chest. So you, you'll rely a lot more on the delts. Um, so, and for lower chest, Will? For lower chest? Yeah. Decline. Decline? Yeah. Oh man, we're looking at uh, about negative 20. Yeah, so probably, probably like a nice so shallow decline. 20, 20 degrees in the yeah. direction. So right here, decline, you're going to optimize lower pecs. And I think that's important, right? So your decline is going to optimize the lower chest. You're talking about hitting more of like, again, like a 40 degree angle, but anywhere from 30 to 50, you'll optimize upper chest. If you get too steep, you're not going to. I think that's key to understand. So now what we're going to talk about is um, uh, what about the width, you know, the width of the bar? Um, you know, there's obviously different angles. You can do like, we talk about close grip, right? Close grip's not going to necessarily be optimal, but when we're talking about for upper chest, or more talking about more like anywhere from shoulder width um, is, you know, basically to not more than 1.5 times shoulder width. Because think about it for a second. When you look at the upper chest and you look at the lower chest, right? The upper chest itself has a better um, uh, moment arm, essentially, or better, it's set up mechanically better for flexion. So we're talking about flexion. The upper chest is better at flexion than the lower chest. So think about it for a second. If I have, if, if I have like my grip kind of like this, and I'm more like shoulder width, I'm getting more flexion of the shoulders than if I have it wide out. I'm not getting as much flexion. So we're talking about when you're doing like bench, if you have like anywhere from like shoulder width to maybe a, a little bit wider than shoulder width, you're gonna have more flexion and so you're gonna activate more of the upper chest. But when you talk about more of a wide grip, which would be considered like 
greater than 1.5 times shoulder width, um, that's going to give a better mechanical advantage for this movement, which is adduction. So when you want a better adduction uh, um, moment arm, that's going to be the lower chest. So basically we're talking about more of a wide grip, not too wide, um, but maybe 1.5 times shoulder width, maybe a little wider than that, but not too wide. That's going to maximize the lower chest. So just think about that when you're, um, when you're actually doing your, your bench press um, or whatever movement that you're doing. The last thing that we talked about uh, in, in the Muscle PhD Academy this week was, um, <clears throat> the, you know, is bench press really the king of all chest movements? One thing I will say is this. We do know, like, as you progressively overload on the bench press, yes, your chest does get bigger. But if you look at muscle activation studies, when they compare machine press, when they compare flies, um, you see as much activation, like when you're doing like flies, if you do them right, um, as when you're seeing like a bench press in the chest itself. It all depends how you're doing them, but if you're doing them right, you do see that activation. So I think that's important that, what does that tell us? If you're just doing bench, you're going to plateau. It's the law of accommodation. So if you're just doing um, flat bench, you're going to plateau. It's a law of accommodation. We did a study um, uh, with Dr. Eduardo de Souza that got published in Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, where when you did a variety of exercises, you got more hypertrophy and you got more regional, like more actually, you know, in, in different heads of musculature than if you actually um, just did like one exercise. So even if you like bench press, we recommend varying it up. So, uh, so that's, that's going to be key. The last thing was like, do, can push-ups help you build mass? If you're, if you're untrained and you can only do eight push-ups, yeah, they're going to be great. But eventually you're going to need some progressive overload, right? So if you can do like 100, 200 push-ups, sure, you could build muscle on that. I'm not saying you can't, but uh, still, if you're going to compare muscle activation relative to like a bench press, you need to add weight to that. So, if, for example, if you're traveling, you just throw a band in your bag, wrap that around you like the infographic I showed, and you're doing bench press, um, and uh, that is going to um, activate your muscles just as much, if not more, depending on the overload than a normal bench press would. So go ahead, quick take-home messages. Um, a wider grip bench, lower pecs, more of a shoulder width apart, maybe a little wider upper pecs. You optimize the angle on incline bench when you're talking about like um, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 degrees, but like Will said, just 40 degrees. Uh, decline bench, probably about negative 20, uh, is going to optimize your lower chest. Uh, machines and flies can work just as good on your chest as bench. So can push-ups, but you've got to hit it within that range. And all, finally, the chest about 60% fast twitch. 40% slow twitch, so we're really talking about 60% of the time really staying 12, 6 to 12 reps if you're bodybuilding, um, and then 40% of the time probably you're going higher, 12 to and above, um, you know, t maybe even a 20 rep burnout, maybe giant sets. What is the best supplement to keep insulin sensitivity optimal during a bulking phase? The best supplement to keep insulin sensitivity optimal during a bu bulking phase? Yes, sir. Uh, berberine is going to be excellent for that, you know, like, um, probably like 0.5 grams three times a day before meals, uh, berberine is going to be excellent, like I said, 0.5 grams like three times a day, if you take like 1.5 at once, you're going to hurt your stomach, um, but that seems to be very helpful for uh, improving insulin sensitivity. Um, oh, what about reverse grip bench, is it true that it activates 85% more upper chest fibers? We'll actually cover this yesterday. Do you want to cover this again, Will? So the question is, reverse grip bench. What's it do? So um, Will's our neurophys mechanics expert, so I'm going to let him take this question. What's going on, guys? So we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, the answer being yes. Um, reverse grip bench does activate the clavicular portion of pec major to quite a quite an extent. Uh, the downside to that being when you externally rotate 
and then go back like that, there's a lot of shoulder flexion basically. Well, basically when you come up, there's a lot of shoulder flexion, this kind of motion, right? So that's where you're gonna hit the clavicular head more. Plum, problem being is when you supinate like that, the shoulders become compromised. So you're not able to lift it as high an intensity as you normally would on an incline with a, a pronated grip. So if you're looking for strength gains and you're trying to lift with maximal intensity, um, and intensity we're talking about overall load, then it might not be the best way to go about things. However, if you're looking for hypertrophy, then if you lower the load and follow the size principle, so basically work in a higher rep range, uh, then it could be beneficial for uh, clavicular head hypertrophy. So um, you can use it, it just depends what your goals are. Nice. Key point that uh, William Walsh is saying is that like, like if you're not gonna be able to lift this heavy, so you're, it's more of a higher repetition type of thing. So probably like the other 40% of the time you're training, it's probably the days you're going to use that reverse uh, bench um, because again you just you can't lift as heavy. Um, so in terms of tempo, what's the best time frame for the eccentric movement? Um, Mike Dodds, good question. Um, <clears throat> so here's the thing to kind of understand, right? They've compared studies where they've done like slow versus faster uh, um, eccentric, and the faster leads to like more muscle growth, more muscle damage, greater strength gains, and your volume's higher. Now I wanna point something out. I don't want people to take this to mean that, you know, you're doing boom, boom, you know, boom, right? That's, you know, you understand what I'm You see the guy in the gym, they're like bench pressing, and they're just like bouncing off their chest. Like, don't, like, quote and go, oh, Wilson said I could bounce it off my chest. That's not what I'm saying. Select a tempo that you can control the weight and that you can develop a good mind-muscle connection on. So if you've been benching a long time, that might be like this. Boom. Boom, right? But then you go, well, isn't time and retention important? Well, think about this. If I'm doing five reps slow or ten reps a little faster, the total time under tension for those ten reps on the eccentric load is probably the same as it was for the five reps. But I'm actually uh, overloading the individual muscle fibers more on the faster than I am the slower um, for a lot of complex mechanisms. So um, as long as you can control the weight and have a mind-muscle connection, that's the tempo you should select. Um, if you're not as well trained, you're not as good with the bench, it might be slower. Once you learn, you'll get faster. Can you do some research in insulin sensitivity post-workout and how to use it to, to your advantage? I mean, uh, I think that you become more insulin sensitive after you train, depending on what you train. So if you cause a lot of muscle damage, you can actually be more insulin resistant. And so like a lot of times people will eat like, they'll go on Thanksgiving, like, oh, I'm gonna like destroy my muscles, I'm gonna do 50 million sets, and then I'm gonna eat whatever I want, but you actually become kind of insulin resistant at that point. So uh, more concentric loading, like Wingate sprinting, on a cycle ergometer where you don't cause a lot of damage, high insulin sensitive, you can take in more carbs. High muscle damage, you actually might be more careful with your carbs that day. What about internal rotation in the short range, external rotation in the long on flies? I'm not sure what about external. I'm not sure, I'm not positive on like the exact question. I'm not sure what you mean. Yeah. Good question. Um, so, uh, so more volume, less frequency, or more frequency, less volume for hypertrophy? Both. <laughs> I mean, yeah. to be quite honest, like, I'll be honest with you, you will adapt to anything. Like, if, if I, so if, I, if I'm used to doing 18 sets, and I do, and, I, and, and I'm not getting anything out of that, and I go six sets Monday, six sets Wednesday, six sets Friday, um, eventually I'm going to adapt to that. I'll, I'll, I'll get more gains at first, but I'll adapt to that. So then say that I took that and instead of did uh, six sets Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I moved it to like nine sets on, or I moved back and hit like 12 sets one day and then six sets another day, that 12 sets is actually gonna be a novel stimulus because I'm not used to it. So our lab is, that's one of the things we're looking into is periodizing frequency, but that's why I say both. But in general, we do know from most studies, 
that like training to a point more like more than once a week is probably ideal you know what I mean like I would hit at least everything twice a week probably um, <clears throat> especially if you're more advanced but as far as like when you say high frequency four days a week five days a week each body part low volume you're gonna adapt to that to where you can move down to two days a week more higher volume so are there any questions from Periscope you want to hit me with? Um, who was that? LOL13. Repeat that question, please. Well, why is your opinion? We can hit something here. Um, That's a good one. How would you program your stress training for hypertrophy uh, training three days a week? We'll look at this question later. The pure, best type of periodization for max hypertrophy. Um, what, so, let's say that again, Andy. Um, how would you periodize your training for hypertrophy oh. if you're training chest three days a week? Oh, okay, same question. All right, cool. Um, okay, so that's a really good question. Um, this is my, my thoughts, and we'll, we'll see what we'll, we'll, we'll chime in here for a second, too. My thoughts on, like, hypertrophy is that variation is key. So, you know, you could, based on the chest anatomy and stuff like that, you're going to want... You might have like a, a basic day where you might be hitting six to eight repetitions, hitting a lot of the fast switch muscle fibers. One day, you know, you might do something that's, um, you know, a little bit higher rep, maybe like 12 to 20 repetitions. Um, and one day, maybe you're kind of in between, like eight to 12 repetitions. So that's one thing, but notice all I did was just talk about varying the repetitions. You know, you can also vary the exercise itself. You know, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I would say that I, I agree with that. I think that uh, um, I would agree with what, uh, with what Doc's saying. What I would do, though, is uh, I would be careful with definitely a um, very firm believer that high-intensity training, and again, intensity, we're talking about overall load, is needed. So working in the lower rep ranges, at the same time, you have to be able to hit, type one fibers can grow, and then those intermediate fibers can grow as well. So you have to hit all rep ranges. What you really want to be careful about is going too high intensity and having too high a volume. When you do that, then you really limit the ability to grow as volume just kind of increases, 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 and then you have nowhere to go from there. Um, especially if you're training chest three times a week, uh, then recovery can be hampered between sessions. So you definitely want to make sure that if your frequency is high, that you need to be careful with your volume. And that volume probably should be tracked um, and probably the most important variable to play around with. So if you're working in the three to five rep range for high intensity, just make sure that you control for sets and that you're not going over in volume so that maybe the next time you hit chest and you're working in the eight to 12 range, um, you're also, you don't have a ridiculous amount of sets, so volume just keeps adding up and up. Uh, eventually, you're gonna see a decrement in performance, uh, and that's just gonna show, uh, so those are just signs of overtraining, um, and you don't grow, um, you don't grow when you're overtrained, performance only suffers. Yeah, that's what we were talking about the other day, is like, uh, we wanna train like crazy, but, and I think it's great, but you also gotta fill your body out too, um, and that's very, very important. Oh. Keisha said we explained that very well. I think she's talking to you, Will. Oh, thank you, Keisha. Thanks, Keisha. So, uh, so what was the question? Chest, shoulders, triceps in the same session. Is that all right? Chest, shoulders, triceps in the same session. Is that all right? Yeah, because if you do your chest, you're going to fatigue your shoulders, and so you can hit them after, and then you, then you do your chest and shoulders, and if you do your triceps, you can finish them off. Again, going on periodization, like if you're going to start off fresh on your um, triceps, that could be a really good thing, you know, if, if they're lagging behind. Um, but I think, again, periodizing things and switching things up because you might be too tired to train your delts after you train your chest. Um, so just think about that. So if they stop growing, separate it out to another day. Um, cool. All right. Next, let's see. Um, oh, Stephanie LeBlanc. Oh, Stefan LeBlanc, sorry. Um, so is cell swelling still good for chest gains, even if the optimal rep range... And we'll take about two more questions after this. Uh, so is cell swelling still good for chest gains, even if the optimal rep range is lower for reps with higher loads? Uh, 
ba- basically, which I think what you're saying is that um, uh, the optimal rep range is lower reps, higher loads for chest. The cell swelling is so important. Uh, what about cell swelling? Yeah, cell I think he's just saying it's cell swelling enough to go higher rep range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he's saying. How yeah. Does that yeah, how does that contribute? I mean, if cell swelling is important for hypertrophy, then remember what we said too. Um, we said that like, you know, you're sixty percent fast twitch, but the other forty percent of the time, we still said you're throwing in those higher repetition ranges and supersets and giant sets. That's going to get the cell swelling effect. I don't know that anyone has um, <clears throat> determined. What's the greatest contributing factor to hypertrophy? There's controversy over the importance of cell swelling, but it, I still say explain this to me. Um, like how, think about like when you're doing like blood flow restriction and you're walking. You have no mechanical stress, right? You have no metabolic stress, and yet you're getting hypertrophy. You have swelling. So... You know, I'm just saying there's a lot of things like that. And then we'll explain this to me. Like when you have someone who's um, like bed rested and you prevent atrophy by wrapping, what's the mechanism? Well, you're getting swelling. It's not mechanical tension. It's not metabolic stress, you know. So I, I don't know, but I would say that basically if that is a mechanism, I'm saying that that other 40% is going to cover that. Anything on there you want me to cover? Um, or I'll just keep it going. No. Fly bench is not necessary for growth. Um, Doc, what is the best method to maximize cell swelling in the pecs in any given hypertrophy session? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go with like basically you're you're um, going to talk about like more supersets, giant sets, strip sets, um, um, anything that keeps tension on a long time. Like for example, intraset stretching. We've actually shown in our lab, we haven't published it yet, we, get, we gathered the data a long time ago, we saw a huge swelling with intraset stretching. Um, anything that maintains tension is going to maximize swelling. Flexing between sets creates... Flexing, yeah. intraset yeah. flexing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Intraset flexing, yeah. right? So flexing between sets. <laughs> We're actually... I, we still got to do that study. Yeah. But... Um, it's a way of occlusion. It's a way of occlusion. It's a way of occlusion, like, and that's what most people don't understand. We, like, I've been attacked before, and go, oh my god, you should never occlude. Like, okay, well then, don't ever lift past like 30, 40 percent of your one RM, right? So, um, <laughs> so you get the point. Um, let's see, Jason Dames, I was curious about your thoughts on carb backloading if you train in the morning. I'll take one more question after after this, Jason. It depends on your goals, right? So there is research that like if you train in a low carb depleted state, it could be good for mitochondria and fat loss, in which case I think carb backloading could be really good. Um, when we're talking about glycogen replenishment and things of that nature, it depends on how frequently you're training. If you're gonna train chest in the morning, chest at night, or you're training a body part every day, maybe having carbs around the workout's important. If, if you're training the chest twice a week, Go ahead and carb backload. It seems to be it might be good for body comp. Um, <clears throat> anything you want me to answer? Okay. Um, can you train strength and hypertrophy in the same session, Mike Dale? Brilliant question, um, Mike. Um, so Mike Dale asks, can you train strength and hypertrophy in the same session? I'll tell you a quick story, and that'll be the last thing we do for today. Um, we have a guy in our lab, John Georges, right? He's he's he's. Uh, really strong guy smart guy and um, he came up to me a few years ago and he's like uh, doc um, I want to do a study uh, where I train a hybrid where I train everything in one session like uh, strength and hypertrophy in the same session um, or separate them out where I have strength days and hypertrophy days what do you think is going to work better I said to be honest I don't know if there's going to be interference going on um, I think separating them out might be better um, but it turns out that he's finished seven subjects in the study. He's, he's actually finishing it off. But based on the seven subjects he's finished, if that continues to be right, uh, my prediction was wrong. So, and that's the cool thing about science is you might predict one thing and you might be wrong. I was wrong in this case. So 
basically what he found is that actually training uh, strength and hypertrophy in the same session actually seemed to be better for like hypertrophy and better for strength. So um, again, that's preliminary data, so we really got to move more on that. I love you.